Hi, Lighthouse family. You know, when uh, Rebecca was young, um, we used to get these catalogs in the mail. They were catalogs of different toys that her and Claire could look through. And never forget that one Christmas as we're going uh, into the Christmas season, Rebecca uh, got one of these catalogs and she started to mark all the different uh, places and toys and things that she wanted. But she took one specific one when she was five years old and she highlighted it and she actually tore it out and she took it with her everywhere she went. And this was a, uh, a Lego castle that she really wanted. And she showed it to Beth and I, and as soon as we saw it, we we're like, wow, that's really cool. And then we saw the price and realized, wow, that's a lot of money. And there's no way we would ever be able to afford that. Well, Rebecca, she took that picture and she carried it with her everywhere she went. She folded it up and she took it in her little purse. She took it in her backpack. Everywhere she went, she carried that with her. And whenever she went to church, she would pull that out and she'd show her Sunday school teacher and she'd show her friends and she'd show our pastor and she'd say, this is the castle I want for Christmas and God's going to give it to me. Well, you know, it just broke my heart because there was no way we were gonna be able to afford at that time to be able to get her this Lego castle. Well, she kept praying, she kept believing, and she just kept saying, God is going to give me that castle. Well, my heart was breaking. I didn't know what to do. In God's intervention, eventually one of our parents found out about it, and they said, hey, we're going to buy that castle for her because they saw how much she desired it and how much she was believing God for it. And even though Beth and I said, man, we just don't know if we want you to spend that much money, they went ahead and they bought that castle for her. So fast forward to Christmas morning, we get there Christmas morning and she goes downstairs and she opens this present. She is amazed and immediately when she saw it, she threw her hands up in the air and she said, thank you, Jesus. You know, for her, God came through an incredible way and showed that he is faithful, even in the small things, or even for kids. You know, a lesson I learned from this is if you aren't desperate, you won't take desperate measures. And if you don't pray like it depends on God, the biggest miracles and best promises you will remain out of your prayer reach. But if you learn how to pray hard like the persistent widow, God will honor our bold prayers because our bold prayers honor God. You know, the persistent widow in Luke 18 was unorthodox in what she did. She could have and technically should have waited for her court date. She probably even crossed a couple of professional lines, and I'm almost surprised the judge didn't get a restraining order against her. But this reveals something about the nature of God. You know, God could care less about protocol. If he did, Jesus would have chosen the Pharisees as disciples. But that isn't who Jesus honored. Jesus honored the prostitute who crashed a party at a Pharisee's home to anoint his feet. Jesus honored the tax collector who climbed a tree. Jesus honored the four friends who cut in line and then cut a hole in someone's ceiling to help their friend. And in this parable, Jesus honored the woman who drove a judge crazy because she wouldn't stop knocking. You know, the common denominator in each of these stories is holy desperation. People took desperate measures to get to God and God honored them for it. You know, today nothing has changed. God is still honoring spiritual desperados who crash parties and climb trees. God is still honoring those who defy protocol in their bold prayers. God is still honoring those who pray with audacity and tenacity. And the persistent widow is selected as that standard that when it comes to praying, you know, her unrelenting persistence was the difference between justice and injustice in our life. The viability of our prayers is not contingent upon scrambling the, the 26 letters of the English alphabet into the right combinations like abracadabra. The viability of our prayers has more to do with heart intensity than vocabulary. That is modeled by the Holy Spirit himself. Long before you woke up this morning, and long after you go to sleep, the Spirit of God was circling you with songs of deliverance. He's been circling you since the day you were conceived, and He'll circle you till the day you die. You see, 
He is praying hard for you with groans that cannot be formulated into words. And those unutterable intercessions should fill you with an unspeakable confidence that he's praying for you. You know, God isn't just for you in some passive sense. God is for you in the most active sense. See, the Holy Spirit, he is praying for hard for you right now in your life. Several centuries before the drought that threatened to destroy Honai's generation, there was another drought in Israel. For three long years, there was no rain in Israel. And then the Lord promised Elijah that he would send rain. But like every promise, Elijah had to circle it via persistent prayer. So Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, fell on his face, and he prayed for rain. And six times he told his servant to look towards the sea. But there was no sign of rain. And that is when most of us give up. We stop praying because we can't see any tangible difference with our natural eyes. And we allow our circumstances to get between God and us instead of putting God between us and our circumstances. You see, like Honey, who said, I will not move from here, Elijah held his holy ground. He stood on the promise God had given him. I think Elijah would have prayed 10,000 times if that is what it took. But between the sixth and seventh prayer, you know, there was this shift that happened in the atmosphere. And after the seventh circle, Elijah's nearsighted servant strained his eyes and saw a small cloud the size of a man rising from the sea. I can't help but ask the question, what if? What if Elijah had quit praying after the sixth circle? The obvious answer is that he would have defaulted on the promise and forfeited the miracle. But Elijah prayed through and God came through. The sky turned black. The heavy winds blew and across the barren landscape. And the raindrops fell for the first time in three years. It wasn't a light drizzle. It was a terrific and incredible rainstorm. You know, it's so easy to give up on dreams, to give up on miracles, to give up on promises. You know, so often we lose heart, we lose patience, we lose faith. And like a slow leak, it often happens without us even knowing it until our prayer life gets flat. You know, is, is there a dream that God wants to resurrect in your life? Is there some promise that you need to maybe reclaim? Is there some miracle you need to start believing for again? The reason that many of us give up too soon is because we feel like we have failed if God doesn't answer our prayer. You know, that isn't failure. The only way you can fail is if you stop praying. Even after three years of drought, And even after a severe bout with depression, Elijah believed that God could send rain. And I can't help but wonder if Honey the Circle Maker was inspired even by the story of Elijah praying for rain several times. And I wonder if Israel's original rainmaker was Honey's childhood hero. I wonder if Honey's persistence in prayer was maybe linked to this miracle. If God did it for Elijah, he can do it for me. But by the same token, I can't help but wonder if Elijah's persistence in prayer was linked to the miracle of maybe raining quail for Israel. If God could send a quail storm for Israel, he can certainly send a thunderstorm for me. One thing is certain, our most powerful prayers are linked to the promises of God. When you know you are praying the promises of God, you pray with a holy confidence. You know, it's the difference between praying on thin ice and praying on solid ground. It's the difference between praying tentatively and praying tenaciously. There's an old adage, God said it and I believe it and that settles it. Here's a fresh take on that old truth. If God said it, I've circled it and that settles it. It was settled on the cross when Jesus said it is finished And it wasn't just the final installment of our sin debt. It was the down payment of all of his promises. Listen, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. You know, God promised Joshua that he would give him every place he set his foot. But there was a little addendum at the end of the promise. Just as I promised Moses. You know, that original promise was given to Moses. But then... It was transferred to Joshua. In much the same way, all of God's promises have been transferred to us via Jesus Christ. 
While those promises must be interpreted intelligently and applied accurately, there are moments when the Spirit of God will quicken your spirit to claim a promise that was originally intended for someone else. So while we have to be careful not to blindly claim promises that don't belong to us, our greatest challenge is that we don't circle the promises we could or even the ones that we should. By most conservative estimates, there are more than 3,000 promises in Scripture. And by virtue of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, every one of them belongs to you. And every one of them has your name on. The question is, is how many of them have you circled? Lighthouse, God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm praying that you have a great discussion time tonight. Remember, if you have had something that God has been spoken into your life and God has said to you this is something that I believe for you hold on to that and allow God to be the one to come